University of Texas at Dallas. I'm Hobson Woldenthal, the provost of the university, and it's my pleasure, as it has been for many years now, to welcome you to what is now the 14th annual Holocaust lecture, the second in that series to enjoy the added title of the Burton C. Einsprut Holocaust Lecture. Uh, these lectures have come to play an extremely important role in the intellectual and cultural and emotional life of the university. They are an event that brings us together as a university and us together with our larger community, friends and associates. And uh, this is yet another singular occasion uh, once again to have all of you here together with our distinguished guest. Intellectually, emotionally, this is a fundamental vital part of the University of Texas at Dallas educational program and its outreach program. It's been wonderful to see it grow over the years, although I will have to say that when I arrived 10 years ago, it was already going strong, thanks to Professor Oshvath. But uh, nonetheless, it's grown and matured still further. And uh, under the leadership of Dr. Einspruch, the eponymous Burton C. Einspruch, and the advisory board of the Holocaust Studies Program, we are continuing to build the program and develop it further. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you, who will introduce Professor Oswath, uh, Dr. Burton C. Einspruch, Chairman of the Board. Burton? I would like to add uh, just a word or two to continue the welcome to you all here and the appreciation we all feel for any support that you give us. You know, the Holocaust has uh, a bizarre chicness to it, and the subject matter has been co-opted by a tremendous vulgarization of such a serious theme. And it's only by the presentation of serious scholars, world-renowned scholars, and especially the mentorship provided by Dr. Wildenthal in the university and also by Dr. Oshworth, our distinguished colleague, that we can keep true scholarship and create an accurate picture of what really transpired. Dr. Oshworth. I would also like to welcome you to this wonderful occasion. And uh, I also would like to express my tremendous gratitude to all those people who are making this to happen, to the provost of the university, um, Hobson Wildenthal, to uh, Dr. Einspruch, to the many members of this community who have helped incredibly wonderfully and strongly and intensely to make this program possible. And I also would like to thank all my students, and I would like to thank especially Debbie Fister, who is the heart and the soul of this program and programming. It is she who uh, doesn't sleep at night and doesn't eat during the day because she is involved in this program. And uh, I would like to especially thank her. I don't know where Debbie is, but I would love if Debbie would stand up. Then I would like now to introduce Professor Robert Wistrich, um, who comes from the University of Jerusalem, um, the Hebrew University. Um, professor Wistrich is a professor of the Neuberger um, uh, Chair of European and Jewish Studies. He also is one of the most highly respected scholar of the Holocaust and has an incredible um, spread in his um, knowledge and in his writings. He has written about many, many aspects of the Holocaust. 
he also was a member of the Vatican Commission um, that has named three uh, Jewish scholars and three scholars from the Vatican to um, study and uh, examine the activities of Pius XII uh, during the Holocaust. He also resigned from that uh, position and after a while the, the, the entire commission has somehow dissolved. But uh, I just would like to tell you that he is involved in a variety of topics um, regarding the Holocaust and regarding the history of anti-Semitism. As a matter of fact, he now became the director of the Institute for Anti-Semitism uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, his books are high intellectual and emotional and stylistic pleasure. He writes beautifully and he writes, he has written a book on, uh, that has the title uh, Hitler and the Holocaust, which is in many ways probably the absolutely best on the topic uh, because it summarizes and analyzes at the same time gives an insight into the latest scholarly works. We are using it in my Holocaust class and I think we all agree that this is a superb intellectual and emotional experience. I would like to, uh, one more word, I wanted to ask him to come, but one more word I want to say. This book and his latest, um, that is a, as a collection of essays on Nietzsche and Nazism is available here in the foyer, so after the lecture is over, if you would like to buy these books, it, uh, they are there um, for you to buy them. Thank you very much, and I would like to uh, ask Professor Vistrich to come and talk to us. After such a wonderful introduction, I feel as if I could rest my case, but uh, I know ever since I've arrived here in Texas, everything that is done in this state is done in a big way. You have a big sky, you have a big state, and I know you have big hearts. Provost, Professor Horschwart, ladies and gentlemen, today the topic concerns the prologue to the Holocaust. And I would like to take you back to the beginning of the 20th century, to the city of Vienna which has rightly been considered one of the most important seed plots of modernist culture and intellectual revolution. It was also the backdrop to an astonishing galaxy of Jewish personalities in the arts and sciences who helped to shape much of Viennese modernity. The rapid growth of the Jewish population in pre-First World War Vienna, at that time the capital of a vast, sprawling, multinational empire, was one factor in the explosion of Jewish talent at that time. Let me illustrate this by a few figures, and I promise these will be the only statistics that I I will inflict upon you tonight. In 1850, there were only four to 5,000 Jews living in the capital of the Habsburg Empire. By 1871, that number had risen to 40,000, an increase of 10 in a matter of 20 years. By 1910, there were 175,000 Jews living in 
a city of two million inhabitants, close to 10% of the population. Anyone studying Central European history at that time is aware that in the course of the 19th century, the Jewish population underwent a rapid and accelerated urbanization and socioeconomic modernization. In the big cities, such as Vienna, but also Berlin, Budapest, and the provincial capitals, Prague, Lemberg, Krakow, we find the same phenomenon. Jews are drawn to the metropolis or the provincial capital. They exhibit a higher level of literacy. In the first stages of modernization, they appear to maximize more successfully the available educational opportunities. In education, for example, we find that after 1880, one third of all the high school students, the gymnasiasten in Vienna, were Jews. That's three times their proportion of the population. At the University of Vienna, at the end of the 1880s, Jews represented 48% of the student body in medicine and 22% of all law students. In 1900, 24% of all university students in Vienna were Jewish, 27% in the higher technical schools, and 43% in the commercial colleges. It is not surprising in the light of these figures that in cities like Vienna, Budapest, Prague, and so on, as well as in the German cities, Jews were so prominent, so conspicuous, so highly visible in the free professions, among intellectuals and avant-garde artists, disproportionately represented among the cultural innovators. Stefan Zweig, in his well-known work, The World of Yesterday, described nine-tenths of Viennese culture of the fin de siècle as being Jewish. An exaggeration, no doubt, but nevertheless pointing to a familiar truth. Jews had become major producers and consumers of modern culture in the space of a generation. Remember, their emancipation in Central Europe, in Austria-Hungary, took place only in 1867, and in the German Reich in 1870-71. And yet, in such a short time, we find that most of the conventional ideas about physics, chemistry, biology, language, philosophy, music, society, and indeed the unconscious mind, have been transformed through Jewish contributions. Not exclusively, of course, but quite strikingly. Jews were filling the theaters and concert halls. They were buying the books and pictures. They were encouraging innovative movements in linguistic philosophy, in psychoanalysis, atonal music, the Young Vienna movement in literature, the Viennese Secession in art. Zweig observed that this was due to their more mobile understanding, little hampered by tradition. They were the exponents and champions of all that was new. In his view, this drive for cultural excellence expressed a burning desire for social integration, an ambition to serve the glory of Vienna, and a cosmopolitan aspiration to transform 
their being Austrian into a mission to the world. Anti-Semites in late 19th century Germany and Austria viewed this self-proclaimed universalist Jewish mission very differently, with fear and alarm as a kind of swamping of indigenous tradition. Yes, Jews might be champions of everything that was new, but was everything that was new desirable? Anti-Semitism and anti-modernism at that time were bedfellows. And frequently we find Jews in Central Europe, as elsewhere, portrayed by cultural conservatives as destroyers of tradition, as rootless cosmopolitans, as opponents of classical order and form, as a threat to national values and to the integrity of the Christian faith. These stereotypes were reinforced by the prominent role of Jews in the liberal and socialist press, in liberalism and Marxist social democracy. In the universities, which became a hotbed in Germany and Austria at this time of the new racial anti-Semitism, we have to understand this reaction partly as a response of acute anxiety towards a new and seemingly unprecedented phenomenon, an expression of envy, of fear, economic competition, and the desire to limit at all costs the entry of Jews into elite institutions. This, of course, was far more widespread than in Central Europe. Racial anti-Semitism first made its presence felt in German Austria from the 1880s onwards. And in fact, Jews found themselves excluded from the German-Austrian student fraternities. The first spokesman of this new trend was the leader of Austrian pan-Germanism, Gorg von Schönerer, someone whom I will come back to later because of his great influence on Adolf Hitler. By 1885, von Schönerer, who originally was perceived as a social reformer, as someone fighting for the democratization of the political system, Schoener was already advocating an Aryan paragraph in his political program, by which he meant the removal of Jewish influence from all areas of public life as being indispensable for the program of social reform. typical of the racist anti-Semitism of that time is the distinction or the belief that there is an absolute gulf between Aryans, so-called Aryans, and so-called Semites, both being the expression of unchanging essences over time. And the Jews were singled out as the eternal enemy by the followers of von Schoenera of Germandom, or Deutschtum, to use the uh, original term. Schoenera had many enemies. The Jews were only one, but they were central to his program. He was also a violent opponent of the Catholic Church. He believed that the future of the German nation depended on the conversion of Austrian Germans who were overwhelmingly Catholic to Protestantism. He called for the expulsion of the Jesuits, among other measures. And one of the slogans of the pan-German movement was that the German cathedral will be built without Judah or Rome. Ohne Jude, ohne Rom wird gebaut Germaniens Dom. It rhymes in German. 
Austrian pan-Germanism was therefore a radical and racist movement which profoundly influenced German National Socialism. Many of the seeds of National Socialism can be found in this period of the 1880s and 1890s. It also called for the Anschluss, the union of all German Austrians with the German fatherland, the new German Reich that had been established by Bismarck in 1870. I mention all this as background because the young Adolf Hitler, as a boy at school in Linz, around 1904-1905, when he was 15 years old, had imbibed many of Schoenerer's racial doctrines. Some of his teachers at school were pan-Germans, particularly in history, and already then he developed that outlook which was subsequently expressed in the time of the Third Reich by that uh, formula, striking formula, ein Reich, ein Volk, ein Führer. One Reich, one empire, one people, one leader. The idea of the Anschluss was born already at that time. It was in the air and it assumed that there was no further legitimacy, no further justification for the existence of Austria as a state. Of course, Austria at that time was not the small Alpine Republic that we know today. It was a vast empire of 50 millions. And it was ruled by a cosmopolitan, supranational dynasty, the Habsburgs, who had been around since the 13th century but whom the pan-Germans hated passionately for having betrayed, as they saw it, the vital interests of the German folk. In Mein Kampf, Hitler tells us that as a boy, he had taken part in, quote, the struggle of the nationalities in old Austria. And he had learned to distinguish between dynastic patriotism, loyalty to the House of Habsburg, and German nationalism. He loathed the dynastic patriotism, but he enthusiastically embraced the German nationalism that demanded an end to the Habsburg state. Heil was our greeting. The Heil came already from the Schoenauer period of the 1880s and 90s. And instead of the imperial anthem, Gott erhalte unter unser Kaiser unser Land. We sang, we sang Deutschland über alles, despite all the warnings and punishments. So already in his youth, Hitler had adopted what was a revolutionary and subversive doctrine of struggle against the existing state. He also had some criticisms of his predecessor, von Schoenerer which were quite astute. He saw that the pan-German movement had failed to address the social question and to win over the broad masses. That it had made a frontal assault on the Catholic Church, which was a fatal error. And that it was wasting its energies on a futile parliamentary struggle. By the time that Hitler arrives in Vienna, he's 18 years old, in the year 1907. Schoenerer's star is waning. He's no longer in the Austrian parliament. Hitler's reaction to Vienna is mixed. On the one hand, as a student of architecture, he falls in love with the buildings of the Ringstrasse, this impressive, grandiose, imperial style of architecture. On the other hand, he is horrified by what he calls the racial chaos. Vienna, Vienna is the archetypal melting pot city. It is, if you wish, the kind of New York 
of its day in Central European terms. And how does Hitler describe this in Mein Kampf? He was sickened by the whole mixture of Czechs, Poles, Hungarians, Ruthenes, Serbs, and Croats, and everywhere, everywhere, the eternal mushroom of humanity, Jews and more Jews. This ancient site of German culture, he tells us, has been corroded by a foreign mixture of peoples, by the poison of foreign nations gnawing away at the body of our nationality. From whence did such violent prejudices derive? Did he already believe this in Linz? Had he absorbed it from his parental home? Was it a function of the personal failure and humiliation that he felt in the seven years that he lived in Vienna between 1907 and 1913, the degradation of his social status. Certainly, he describes this period as the memory of the saddest time of my life, but also this difficult period was the most thorough school of my life, the gründlichste Schule meines Lebens. Hitler did not like the glittering, hedonistic side of Vienna. But he claims that the most important political lessons of his life were learned there. These were the years of his apprenticeship. Some historians have argued, and to some degree I go along with this, that although Vienna was important, the systematization of his worldview and those ideas that would eventually lead to the Holocaust occurred later in Munich. That it was in Munich after the First World War that he developed a truly manic and obsessive anti-Semitism. There are others like Brigitte Hamann who do not doubt that Austria was indeed the matrix of Hitler's personality and politics, but who point out, and this is I think the virtue of uh, Brigitte Hamann's work, that the young Hitler was far more ambivalent about Jews than he subsequently implied. For example, we know that in the time that he was eking out a living rather desperately by painting watercolors and picture postcard views of the buildings in Vienna, he was very much dependent on Jewish art dealers. Indeed, his closest partner in the art production, if we can call it that, of those years was a Hungarian Jew called Josef Neumann. And they enjoyed a close relationship. Equally, we know that the young Hitler had business dealings with other Jews which were reported to be good. And this at a time when he was living in a doss house for the homeless among the tramps and the winos and the down and outs in society's basement. The testimony of Reinhold Hanisch, for instance, goes beyond this. He reports Hitler admiring Jewish tenacity in preserving their racial cohesion against continuous persecution. He repudiates the medieval blood libel charges, which are the commonplace of Catholic clerics in Austria at that time. He shows distaste for some of the Christian social demagogues of the period who denounced Jewish usury while ignoring Christian exploitation. And we even have some testimonies that suggest that Hitler praised the music 
of composers, Jewish composers, such as Offenbach, Mendelssohn Bartholdi, and the poetry of Heine. Even his boyhood friend, August Kubitschek, who traced Hitler's anti-Semitism back much further, acknowledges that he took the defense of Gustav Mahler at a time when it was very unfashionable to do so in Vienna. Remember that Mahler had been appointed the director of the Imperial Royal Opera House and remained in that position from 1897 to 1907. Mahler, a converted Jew, was the target of relentless anti-Semitic barbs. But it appears that Hitler admired Mahler's renditions of Wagnerian opera so much that he was not prepared to join the chorus of Mahler's adversaries. We might also question the assumption that has often been made by historians that Hitler's adulation of Richard Wagner, which began already in Linz in his teenage years, would automatically have turned him at that time into a fully-fledged anti-Semite. There can be no doubting Wagner's effect on Hitler's imagination as not just as a great composer, but as a prophet, as a guiding star. And I'm even prepared to believe the account of Kubitschek that at the age of 17, in listening to Wagner's opera at the Linz Opera House, Rienzi, one of Wagner's early operas, that Hitler became convinced of his destiny to lead the German people from servitude to freedom. Certainly we can never ignore Wagner's impact, whether it was in Linz as a teenager, in Vienna where he would spend his last uh, uh, farthings to, in order to attend one of Wagner's operas, or later in Bayreuth, it appears that he was intoxicated, transported into a mystical universe of Germanic myth, of drama and spectacle, of titanic struggles, stories of salvation, victory and death. Wagner's themes of betrayal, sacrifice, redemption and heroic death all spoke to Hitler in a special way, but they did also to many others who did not share his politics. Later, he would point to Wagner as one of the keys to understanding National Socialism, and he would speak of his own racial interpretations of operas such as Parsifal. But there is some room for doubt as to whether Wagner's extreme views on the Jewish question were what really interested Hitler at that time. Certainly we have no direct evidence for the fact. What I believe was the true impact of Wagner was much more in the realm of myth, of theatricality, the mass spectacle, and the self-made hero who mysteriously embodies the impulses of the national spirit, the Volksgeist. Kubitschek, on the whole, is a reliable witness on many areas of Hitler's adolescence, since he was the only friend, uh, the only friend in those years in Linz and then in Vienna. And he reports that Hitler's anti-Semitism was already pronounced in Linz when he was 15. For example, when they were passing a little synagogue, Hitler is reported to have said, this should not be here. At the technical school, the Realschule in Linz, uh, their teachers, he says, made no bones about their hatred of Jews 
in front of their pupils, something that Hitler himself does not say. He also argues more plausibly, perhaps, that since we know that Hitler was a follower of von Schoenerer, and since all the pan-Germans were anti-Semitic, he must have understood the political implications already then. Likewise, that his hatred of Czechs was already fully formed in Linz. But this is the only testimony that we have to this effect. In a curriculum vitae, which Hitler sent to an unknown recipient in 1921, when he was 32 years old, he wrote regarding his own family background, I came from a fairly cosmopolitan family, but the school of harsh reality turned me into an anti-Semite within a year. This is before Mein Kampf, this is a private letter, he doesn't need to impress anyone for propagandist reasons. So it's interesting that this, this is a version to which he stuck, that his father was essentially liberal, his father was an Austrian customs official, a loyal servant of the Habsburg state. His father was liberal and even perhaps cosmopolitan, but that he, who did not start out with any prejudices against Jews, became, as a result of his harsh experiences in Vienna, an anti-Semite within a year. In Mein Kampf, he talks about a conversion experience, of being converted from, and I use this term, weak-kneed cosmopolitan to hardened anti-Semite. And he describes it as an intense soul struggle, the most intense inner mental struggle of his entire life. What does he attribute the conversion to? The visual instruction of the Vienna streets. And he calls it a victory, becoming an anti-Semite, a victory of the head over the heart of reason over sentimentality. And a dramatic encounter is described, which sounds possibly fictional, of how he, the young Adolf Hitler, is walking in the first district of Vienna, the Innere Stadt, and he encounters an East European Jew, an ost Jude, And this, this is what he says. Once as I was strolling in the inner city, I encountered an apparition in a black kaftan and black hair locks. Is this a Jew? Was my first thought. And to be sure, they had not looked like that in Linz. I observed the man furtively and cautiously, but the longer I stared at his foreign face, scrutinizing it feature for feature, the more my first question assumed a new form. Is this a German? Wherever I went, I began to see Jews, and the more I saw, the more sharply they became distinguished in my eyes from the rest of humanity, particularly in the inner city and the districts north of the Danube Canal, which swarmed with a people who even outwardly had lost all resemblance to Germans. Here we have a description, an apparent description of a recent Orthodox Jewish immigrant almost certainly from Galicia, perhaps a Hasidic Jew, of whom there were about 50,000 in Vienna at that time, as we know. In 1908, the Jews of Galicia, who would have answered to such a description, accounted for approximately 25% of the Jewish population of the city. We also know that Hitler was living at that time in the Brigittenau district of Vienna, and he would certainly have encountered many such Kaftan Jews in this district. What he says is plausible with regard to Linz, where he came from, where he, he had gone to school. Linz was an overwhelmingly German city. There were no Ostjuden, no East European Jews in Linz, no immigrants from 
Galicia. In fact, one of the Jews that he knew best in Linz was the family doctor. The Hitler family doctor was an assimilated Jew called Dr. Edward Bloch. And he looked thoroughly German. So there is some plausibility in this description. Of course, Dr. Bloch had treated Hitler's mother, Clara, who died of breast cancer at the age of 46 in 1907. I would assume from this that Hitler had not yet developed a blanket and total rejection of all Jews. We know, for instance, that his attitude to Dr. Bloch, despite the death of his mother, remained respectful. And that even after the Anschluss in 1938 permitted him to leave with relatively little difficulty for America. And there are descriptions subsequently of Dr. Bloch, of the young Adolf Hitler, when he was in America, uh, describing him in terms that are difficult to reconcile with our subsequent image. But the description of the, the East European Jew is already violently xenophob xenophobic. The Jew looks and smells different. You could tell, in parenthesis he says, you could tell that they were no lovers of water. The Ostjude is the quintessential alien, and his otherness raises a fundamental question about who is a German. You have to understand the acute anxiety that such a question raised in Vienna, such a cosmopolitan and racially mixed city with a fear of German Austrians that their numbers were declining and that they were in danger of national extinction. The Brigittenau district, by the way, very much resembles many European and perhaps some American cities today in so far as that it was overwhelmingly full of foreign or new immigrants. Indeed, 80% of the population, this has been established statistically, 80% of the population of the district where Hitler was living were not did not have the legal right of residence in Vienna. I think that what we have here is the characteristic trauma of the déclassé, the young man from the provincial backwards, disoriented by metropolitan life, feeling threatened by modernity, by the class struggle, by liberal democracy, falling back on primitive certainties of blood and race. This is exaggerated in Hitler's case by the dramatic loss of social status from a lower middle class respectable family to becoming a failed bohemian dropout. In 1908, the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna had rejected him and put paid to his dreams of becoming a famous architect or painter. He had lost his mother under tragic circumstances. He was an orphan. And he refused to take a regular job. Engulfed by this sense of personal failure and a latent paranoia, Hitler at this time, from all the reports that we have, already begins to indulge in endless tirades against the whole world, but especially against the ethnic babble of the Vienna streets and against the foreign-looking Jews. This hardens into a total obsession that is so powerful that in 1931, in an interview with a German uh, newspaper editor, he says the following, there can be no true racial policy which does not safeguard our biological Aryan roots. We intend one day to give this ideological principle the force of law. Even today, our youth is crying with good reason, Germany awake, down with Jewry. In Vienna, I learnt to hate the Jews. Any license given 
to the Vienna Jews was tantamount to an increase in the number of destructive parasites. Vienna has turned itself into a metropolis of decay and filth. People there sponsor books opposing the reawakening of Germany. Obviously, we shall have to burn this rubbish and have a clean-up in Vienna as in Berlin. Two years before the seizure of power, two years before the burning of the books, four years before the Nuremberg race laws. In 1933, he tells his fellow Nazi Hermann Rauschning that the Jews have overrun Vienna, which, was, which is no more a German city, which is in fact uh, ruled by Slavs and Jews. The Austrians will have to eliminate these groups if they're to be properly retrained and incorporated into the greater German Reich. When this incorporation occurs in March 1938, it is, I think, significant that one of the first things that Hitler does to his beloved homeland is to obliterate its name. Austria disappears from the map. It becomes, it is henceforth known by the Nazified term of the Ostmark. The, uh, the country is divided into seven Gower. Lower Austria becomes the Lower Danube, Upper Austria becomes the Upper Danube. Any manifestation of Austrian patriotism is ruthlessly excised. And Vienna, Judaized, Slavicized, and cosmopolitan Vienna is downgraded very deliberately from its historic role as a world city because it had betrayed, it had betrayed the cause of Germandom. Linz, Linz, the city of Hitler's youth, was being groomed by him to become a new capital of art and to take Vienna's place as the metropolis on the Danube. So I think part of the root of Hitler's anti-Semitism is the reflex of the narrow-minded provincial hatred of Vienna, partly it's the byproduct of the fashionable racist philosophies of that time, the horror and indignation against the big city which is destroying the fabric of the nation, against the multiculturalism of the melting pot, against racial miscegenation, and soulless modernity, all of them being linked, linked with the presence of the Jews. There's no sense of that great cultural transformation that I began uh, my talk with tonight. No references can be found in Mein Kampf to any of the artists, the intellectuals, the philosophers, whether Jewish or not Jewish, whom we now recall as part of the cultural glory of uh, Vienna. Another point that has to be taken into account with regard to this experience is the puritanical reaction of Hitler to the sexual mores of Vienna. In particular, he was stunned by the scale of prostitution and obsessed with the danger of infection and venereal disease. Uh, to this we should add that he exhibited a very strong uh, Victorian prudery in such matters. As far as we know, there were no uh, women in his life at that time, either in Linz or Vienna. He lived in a sort of monk-like asceticism. And Kubitschek reports quite extensively on how obsessed he became with uh, the goings-on in the red light district of the city. He could never let himself go, ex exhibited a very strict moral code, was obsessed with purity in body and soul, 
and with the need to encourage young people to produce healthy children for the survival of the folk. He was already um, making long speeches uh, about this subject um, in those years uh, to anyone who would listen, not public speeches. And I think that this element of um, coming to see sexuality as our, or sexual permissiveness, which was certainly widespread in the Vienna of that time, as a weapon in the hands of so-called inferior breeds who were deliberately setting out to weaken and corrupt the moral fiber of the creative and heroic Aryan race. This is a theme that should not be underestimated. It gives a special, uh, especially irrational um, and fanatical quality uh, to some of the anti-Semitic, uh, the anti-Semitic statements that we find in Mein Kampf. The link between Jews prostitution, syphilis, the white slavery trade uh, is repeatedly described in semi-hysterical tones. For instance, uh, where he says uh, in Mein Kampf, one could witness hideous sexual proceedings that most German people could not even imagine. Or when he visited, um, after visiting the red light district, he concludes that the Jew, the Jew, was the cold-hearted, shameless, and calculating director of this revolting vice traffic in the scum of the city. I would see this as a classical projection of a, a very repressed sexuality, um, and possibly the fear of tainted blood in his own family, which uh, gave um, an additional edge to this uh, form of anti-Semitism. There was also a political dimension which derived from close observation of the career of the mayor of Vienna at that time, Dr. Karl Luega. He was mayor of the city between 1897 and 1911. And Hitler's arrival in the city coincided with Luega's greatest uh, electoral triumph when his Christian Social Party emerged as the largest single uh, parliamentary faction in the Austrian parliament. We have many examples of the admiration with which he regarded Luega's, uh, Luega's political skills, even if he could not and did not identify with his Catholic piety or apparent Catholic piety and loyalty to uh, the Habsburg dynasty. When it came to issues of race and the Jewish question, he always preferred Schoenerer's intransigent stance. But the Christian Social Party impressed the young Hitler with its practical wisdom, its attitude towards socialism, its understanding of the popular masses. Luega had understood the need to win over those groups in the population whose existence was in danger. And he also understood the need to gain the support of long-established institutions, such as the Catholic Church, in order to draw the greatest possible advantage from these old sources of power. These were valuable political lessons which were put to good effect during the years of the Weimar Republic. Hitler indeed described Luega as a veritable virtuoso in the art of working up the spiritual instincts of the broad masses and praised his tactical sense and understanding of human nature. There should be no doubt that Luega demonstrated in a way that no other politician before him had done so that in the new mass politics of the 1890s and the 1900s, a democratized, relatively democratized system, anti-Semitism could be a winning electoral formula. 
It's difficult to exaggerate the importance of this realization. Luega, in order to come to power in Vienna as the mayor of the city, had used a relentless campaign against the Jews on the stock exchange, the Jews who controlled the metropolitan press, the peddler Jews, the Jews who con allegedly controlled and to some extent were in the top leadership of the social democracy in Austria, and he ranted against the Judeo-Magyars, the Jews of Budapest, exploiting the Viennese population's dislike of Hungarians, uh, which was almost equal to their dislike of Jews. And above all, after 1900, the Luega movement maintained its grip on power by conducting a relentless campaign against the Reds and the Jews, the rising social democracy, which was its most dangerous rival, and focusing attention on the fact that there were quite a number of prominent Jewish intellectuals in its leading ranks. No doubt, Hitler learned much from this example. He had before him a case, study, of a politician who was the first in Europe or anywhere in the world to show how anti-Semitism could be used as a battering ram in order to win power and also to ma maintain a grip upon it. And yet the interesting thing is that in Mein Kampf, Hitler is also quite critical of the type of anti-Semitism that Luega's movement embodied. His main criticism is this is a sham. This anti-Semitism does not deal with the problem of baptized Jews. Baptized Jews were even held important positions in the Christian Social Party. It permits Jews in big business to retain their positions. It utilizes clerical prejudices which are unscientific, and above all, it's opportunistic. The mayor of Vienna was notorious for, for his famous definition of the Jewish question, wer ein Jud ist, das bestimme ich. I decide who is a Jew. This did not suit Hitler. He left Vienna in 1913 at the age of 24, claiming that he had established the foundations of his philosophy in general and a political view which he only needed to supplement in details. He said that he was already an absolute anti-Semite and a mortal enemy of the Marxist worldview. That he had learned from Vienna that the Jews and social democracy were intimately intertwined. But Hitler in 1913 was an unknown, a nobody. He was far from being the Hitler of history. As far as his contemporary at that time in the city, another relatively unknown individual, a little better known than Hitler, Leon Trotsky, who lived in the city in exactly the same period. And there is a famous remark of the Austrian foreign minister on the outbreak of the Russian Revolution when uh, the news is brought to him and he says, uh, supposed to say ironically, well, who, who has made this revolution? It can't be Herr Bronstein, that was Trotsky's original name, uh, playing chess in the Café Central. Here we have a problem which it many times recurs in history. How is it possible that in the space of such a short period, a completely unknown, obscure, unimportant figure sitting in a cafe, coffee house, uh, playing chess, or like... Hitler painting picture postcards down and out in Vienna will become, in a matter of a few years, catapulted to the leadership of a revolution or a mass movement and completely transform the world. There would have been no Hitler of history without the First World War, without the destruction of that relatively stable and hierarchical framework that existed in Central Europe uh, uh, the rule of law that existed uh, under the Habsburg monarchy. There would have been no Hitler of history if he had not emigrated to Germany, 
the land in which he had concentrated and focused all his dreams, his aspirations, and his political ideals. There would have been no Hitler of Germany, uh, Hitler of history, without the national humiliation of the Germans as a result of a lost war, the collapse of the Hohenzollern monarchy, the Versailles Treaty, the massive reparations demanded by the Western Allies, and the fear of Bolshevik revolution. That Germany was ripe for the Jewish conspiracy theory, for the belief that Marxists, Jews, and pacifists had stabbed Germany in the back, that they were responsible for all the evils that had befallen it. And it was against that background of war, revolution, and counter-revolution that Hitler could begin to make an impact with an anti-Semitism that became far more intense and radical than what he would have picked up on the streets of Vienna. It's no accident in 1919, at 30 years of age, that for the first time he publicly addresses the Jewish question when he's demobilized from the German army and goes back to Munich. That is the year in which he decides to become a politician. And to save Germany from the specter of Jewish Bolshevism. That is the time that he establishes the National Socialist Movement as a great counter movement to communism. And it is in the atmosphere, the apocalyptic atmosphere of the early Weimar years that he develops a more extreme version of anti-Semitism, the kind in which he talks almost in religious terms. I am fighting in defending myself against the Jew. I am fighting of the Lord. The Jews now emerge as the key to history, to the future of Germany and of Aryan civilization. Munich itself, which is now Hitler's home, Munich in 1918-19 is the El Dorado of the radical right. It's a rallying ground for every conceivable kind of reactionary group. Ultra-conservative monarchists, anti-republicans of every stripe, extremist folkish sects, racist and anti-Semitic leagues, of which the Nazis are only one, originally, small group. Munich, a conservative Catholic city, experiences in 1918-19 two revolutions from the left. First, the, re the Republic under Kurt Eisner of Workers and Soldiers Councils, which was crushed by the Freikorps, and then the short-lived episode of the Munich Soviet Republic. And a number of Jewish intellectuals once more come to the foreground as prominent leaders of both these experiments, something that undoubtedly hardened the attitudes, not only of Hitler, but of all of the original cadre that made up the le leadership of the Nazi movement. We might say that it was only in Munich that Hitler became the fully-fledged Judeophobe for whom the Jewish question was absolutely primary. And this happened sometime between the 9th of November 1918 and May 1919 when the counter-revolution was victorious in Munich. Remember this date, the 9th November, November the 9th, 1918. 9-11 if you're British, as it happens. Um, Hitler would constantly and obsessively refer to the 9th of November. It was the seminal event. It coincided in his mind with a personal trauma and his recovery from it, of having lost his eyesight as a result of a gas attack on the Western Front and recovering it in a military hospital in Passauwald. It coincides with the news of Germany's surrender. 
the flight of the German emperor, the Hohenzollern emperor, the end of the monarchy, and the beginning of the republic. The republic that the Nazis always referred to as the Jewish Republic, the Judenrepublik. The 9th of November 1918 was the national disgrace. There had to be expunged, if necessary, by a Second World War that would definitively wipe out the memory of the betrayal, of the stab in the back, of the surrender, surrender of the German army. That defeat was forever linked in Hitler's mind with the Jews and with Marxist revolution. It was the matrix which transformed all his pre-war phobias about Jews, the ones that he had picked up in Vienna, into a deadly and genocidal cocktail. In 1939, shortly before the outbreak of the Second World War, he told a Czech diplomat, never again will there be a second 9th of November in German history. And he, he, Hitler, would make sure of that by destroying the Jews. He linked the two things very specifically and precisely. So the anti-Semitic credo which had developed in Vienna, but was still not fully crystallized. After this event and its follow-up became a political program in the maelstrom of revolution and counter-revolution, which convulsed Munich in 1918-19. It was in that cauldron that Hitler found his voice, discovered that he had an extraordinary gift for public speaking. The tone of his communications completely changes, becomes far more harsh and strident. It's no longer the apolitical aesthete, the lonely dreamer that he had been in his Vienna years. In the Munich beer cellars, a groundswell of folkish nationalist sentiment, anti-Marxism, and violent anti-Semitism begins to propel him forward on the path which would ultimately lead to Auschwitz. That was the real prologue to the final solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Listich, for this wonderful talk. And we would like now to ask you to ask questions. He will answer them for a while, I am sure. Please go ahead and ask questions. Uh, yes, thank you. I uh, always tell my students, um, only half jokingly, that I feel that the professors at the Academy of Art in Vienna, of Fine Arts, have a great deal to answer for to the world. <laughs> because in my own mind, I'm fairly certain that had he been accepted and had he been able to fulfill uh, what I think was his most genuine and deepest dream, which was to be a successful architect, um, the world would have been spared unbelievable degree of pain and suffering. And th 
this is one of those instances where, of course, we're dealing with hypotheses and speculations, but it's one of those moments that one uh, one really doesn't know what to make of the the immense dichotomy between such a seemingly unimportant uh, and yet so fateful uh, moment of rejection. Uh, in fact, many people think that Hitler was not a particularly uh, interesting or uh, talented artist. Um, certainly if you judge him by the standards of uh, all the, you know, the, the transformations and revolutions that were going on in painting and in architecture, his taste seems very conservative, bourgeois, reactionary and so on. But he was a good draftsman. Actually, I, I find his drawings very meticulous and um, he was, a, a, if you like, a talented uh, dilettante with an extraordinary passion for architecture all his life. There are two, only two things that ever made Hitler really seem human, uh, and that's when he was entranced by uh, Wagner's music or other uh, forms of um, other concerts and, and so on, and his architectural, uh, his architectural passion. I mean, Albert Speer is, is good on that and um, underlines that that this was something that, that engaged his mind uh, constantly. And it was like there was another Hitler, it was like you're talking about a schizophrenic personality, which I'm not suggesting he was, but the Hitler who was almost boyishly uh, uh, passionate for, for drawing uh, and sketching and architectural models and dreaming about reconstructing this city and that, and the other, the destructive, the maniacal, the fanatical, the genocidal Hitler, is quite difficult to reconcile. But if the one side had achieved fulfillment, perhaps we would never have seen the other. Well, of course, uh, it's important to try and be precise about this. Uh, I was suggesting tonight that Munich 1918-19 is a turning point as prologue, no more. I wasn't saying anything beyond, not that the, Hol the Holocaust was, as it were, born in that moment uh, that that Hitler declares that he becomes a politician and creates the National Socialist Movement in Munich in 1919. I don't believe that would be true in a, a straightforward sense. It was the prologue, though, because that was the real starting point from which everything else flowed, because uh, w the, that movement was the was the vehicle was the vehicle for coming to power there was no other way uh, and uh, the engagement with politics because what what was Hitler before he became the Hitler of history he was the Hitler I described in Vienna who uh, was living in a dos house living among tramps among dropouts among uh, you know the dregs of society and from time to time he would make these, uh, if he was provoked, uh, he would start speaking in a very animated way. But nobody was listening, right? He didn't even discover that um, an audience, until he began to speak in the Munich beer cellars, in the atmosphere of 1919. Now, he, to get to that point, he had to go through 
uh, the experience of the First World War, the uh, sense of um, tremendous convulsion and upheaval that is difficult to imagine that what Germany had gone through uh, and emerged in 1918-19. And that, I think, uh, the question there, to me, the interesting question is, well, why from very such unpromising beginnings? I mean, he wasn't even a German citizen you know, until 1932. Very few people realize that. Um, uh, that with no apparent prospects, no real background, a complete nobody, that uh, he, he became what we know. And I think that, you see, the, the Jewish issue provided him with a compass, with a, an anchor point. He says in Mein Kampf that it's very important to have a single visible enemy in which you against whom you can concentrate all of the uh, all of the um, instincts of uh, which he knew so well how to mobilize I think that was very calculated with regard to obviously the story of how the so-called final solution or the Holocaust, the murder of European Jewry happened. You know, in my book, I, 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 I provide an attempt at s laying out the stages in which that occurred. I don't believe everything was pre-planned, that it was inevitable, uh, and so on. What I do think is that from about 1919-20, you see a certain genocidal logic which is already implicit in you read the speeches of the time. You see that the endless references, for instance, to eradicating vermin, you know, the, the uh, tearing out the cancer in the heart of the German people, to refer to Jews, or for that matter, any other group, as, uh, as uh, tuberculosis or you know, racial tuberculosis, as cancer, as vermin. Uh, these, this is a genocidal language. Nobody realized it perhaps at the time because nobody could imagine that this would be so literally implemented. But, but in retrospect, you, you can see that there's a connection between words and deeds. So you can say the language already points as early as 1919-20 to what will follow. But you need any number of conditions and circumstances, presuppositions for that to happen. First of all, about you have to be in a position that you have the power at your disposal, the whole of a you know apparatus of a modern state, and you are able to carry a population with you that that is prepared to go along with and be complicit in or actively perpetrate such actions. You have to have conditions of war. Clearly in peacetime none of this would have happened. You'd have had what we saw, which was terrible and bad enough, the expulsion, the expulsion of Jews, their gradual you know, removal from, but you wouldn't have had a Holocaust. So there are any number of conditions that are necessary before that ideology can be put into practice. But I think as prologue that it, what I tried to outline here uh, tonight, that was, that was really the most important turning point to begin the path, the long path towards uh, Auschwitz. We're all witnessing the wave of anti-Semitism sweeping across Europe, especially in France, Belgium, outlaws, uh, Kashua, kosher slaughtering. We know, of course, that Nazi terminology and uh, verbiage has been adopted wholesale by the Arab countries and Saudi Arabia, Syria, so on. As a historian of anti-Semitism, do you share with us your feelings and thoughts about witnessing something that you thought was ancient history? 
Well, I never thought it was ancient history. You know, um, uh, at the end of the millennium, on the last day of uh, 1999, uh, I actually published an article uh, which I, I'd been commissioned actually to, to write it. The, the headline was, or the title was, The End of Antisemitism? Question mark. And at that time, it seems not long ago, right? The end of 1999, the conventional wisdom in many quarters, including among academics and students of the subject, was that antisemitism was on the decline, that it was receding, that it was becoming a marginal or a secondary issue. There were even those who spoke about it dying out. I remember in this country too. And I wrote this article sounding a note of caution. And it concluded, fortunately for me I must say in retrospect, it concluded with a sentence to the effect that never is anti-Semitism more dangerous than at the moment when people begin to write its obituary. And that, within a year, that proved, not that I'm happy about it, although some people say that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're in a scholar engaged in it, in a sense it's good for you because, you know, you have a lot of work to do. But, you know, nobody takes anti-Semitism lightly, and it is not pleasant, and I spent the last two years, uh, two months, sorry, in, in Europe, researching this very topic that you asked about and uh, seeing it up front is uh, very sobering even though it in no way surprised me and uh, I, I always thought that you know the potential was there it would only take a trigger most likely that it would be a Middle East crisis, which in effect I believe was the trigger, although the latent you know, sentiment is there and has its own indigenous sources. And of course I don't believe America is really immune, although the situation is, is noticeably better here at the moment than it is in Europe. What you refer to regarding Barbara Amiel's article really relates to her experiences, uh, let's say in the upper levels of London society, the salons, the uh, dinner parties, the kind of comments which were not acceptable a few years ago, but now people feel, certain people feel, can be more, made more freely. The comments about, oh, uh, really, you know, well, like she reported about the French ambassador, of course. Uh, this is true uh, in my own experience. This is happening and it also shows that people take their lead these days a lot from the media. Uh, the British media, for example, like, like the French and the, uh, the Scandinavian and, and the Belgian and so on and so on, uh, report everything that relates to Israel and to Jewish support for Israel in, in present it in such a one-sided, such a negative, such a hostile manner, it creates a climate, a climate uh, of hostility. And uh, that has consequences. Um, do you think you could spell the name because no? It's the first time I've heard such a person named, so it would be very surprising. Uh, I I really don't know who you could be referring to. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Which was very troubling because you described both anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. 
Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, you're, you're referring to uh, a research uh, report, it's about 50 odd pages or so, that I uh, wrote very recently actually for the American Jewish Committee on Muslim anti-Semitism, a contemporary, uh, what's it called, a real and clear and present danger. What is it leading to? What is it a prologue to? Unfortunately, it's not a prologue. It's beyond the prologue. Um, I can't say how far down the road it is. What, uh, what I can say is, first of all, if I try as a historian to draw some kind of measured comparison between the, the literature, the propaganda, the impact of Muslim anti-Semitism of the type that I describe and analyze there, I think in quantity and in quality, it, uh, it has a scope as great as that which was coming out of Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Uh, in the Middle East, I'm referring to uh, the Arab world and to a lesser extent to the non-Arab Muslim world, certain countries where this kind of uh, literature also has uh, great uh, resonance. I think that the difference, therefore, if I put it in that category, I'm saying that it is not just worrying, it is appalling, it is unbelievable. Uh, and even as someone who has followed this for 20 years, right, so it's not new to me, I was taken aback at the degree to which it's been amplified, partly because of the modern mass communications, the impact of the internet, uh, of the, you know, uh, television channels. Today, you know, a station like Al Jazeera reaches the most, uh, you know, the most... Uh, outlying little corners of, of the Arab world, even among illiterate, you know, falahin and so on, uh, so that uh, images relayed of violence, of things that occur in Palestine, let's say, um, affect millions of people who would have been quite untouched by a more esoteric literature. So, it, yes, it has great resonance. It, it has a very corrupting effect, part of the reason I think that we have no peace with uh, the Palestinians. I make this point again and again. It seems to fall on deaf ears, but eventually I think the awakening will come, uh, is that we're talking about a culture of hatred that has been systematically indoctrinate, um, indoctrinated into uh, masses of people for decades and which has particularly um, you know, become more intense in the last two years, which is what I focused on here. But when you talk about a culture of hatred, you cannot be surprised, can't be surprised if it leads to suicide bombers, to uh, completely irrational forms of violence, terrorism, uh, and uh, intransigence. These things are interconnected much more than we realize. The news media don't do this. They don't cover this because everything is soundbite and the instant pundit who will always focus on the immediate issue about, well, what's going to happen now? Nobody really wants to go into this. Uh, although, I, I must say, I did present some of my findings in Washington, you know, to a group of senators and congressmen who were more receptive, even than in my own country. That's to say, I think there's a bit more understanding of that among certain people in America 
that I've found in Israel, where I think that has political reasons. It's a deliberate shutting out of this reality. It's not, there are very good Arabists and um, Islamologues and so on in Israel. Most of them don't want to deal with this. It's not that they don't know about it, they just don't want to deal with it. You see, our greatest danger, uh, I would say this first of all with regard to, to Jews, but it's not an exclusively Jewish problem, uh, is the very understandable human reluctance to face unpleasant facts. Uh, this is the connection I would make with the time of the Holocaust. You see, I, I, I fear that there, is, there are signs of a, a similar syndrome. Not so much that we're in the same position, because we're not, thank God. But the denial of reality, I mean, I think that Jews in the pre-Holocaust period really uh, you know, engaged in all kinds of wishful thinking. Whether or not that could have changed their fate, I don't know. It's not an accusation. It's a, it's a statement more of fact, in retrospect. Um, and I, I think it would not be wise that we would indulge in that. We don't have the luxury. We don't have the luxury for that. We need to know about these things. We need to, to bring it up. I bring it up with Muslims, very upfront. Funnily enough, they not only do not deny it, um, I mean those who know something about it are perfectly well aware of what I'm talking about. They will argue about the causes of it, but they won't deny that it's out there and that it exists. And to that extent, they're more realistic than many people who for all kinds of reasons, psychological, political and otherwise, just don't want to accept that, that this phenomenon is, is fairly massive now. It's mainstream, it's not marginal, it's not insignificant. It permeates, it permeates the Arab and Muslim world, and I think it's part of the reason that that world is in a complete and utter mess. Thank you very much.